Hi, thank you for coming. I'm not that loud. Am I loud enough? Yeah, yeah. yeah I'm like soft-spoken. So <laughs> um, thank you so much for coming. It's super great to see lots of people I know and people I don't know. Um, there are a few people I want to thank before the screening. Um, of course, um, Adam and Los Angeles Film Forum. It's really great to have an LA screening. I did a lot of shooting in LA. This project, in fact, started in LA with three weeks of shooting uh, in the summer of 2015. Um, so I really wanted to bring the film back to LA and it took a little time to figure out um, the right venue and the right time, but I'm very happy um, to do this here. Um, a couple people who are here, uh, Jenny Amaya, who's sitting in the back, who um, took some sound in Los Angeles, but was also an assistant editor for the project and did a lot of work on it. Um, and then two people who are in the film are here and I'm really excited to share the film with them. Um, they'll be seeing it, I think, for the first time, maybe, <laughs> with all of you. Um, but Jenny Wren, who's back there, uh, and Dina Metzger, who's here, are both really special parts of the film. Um, and you'll see them on screen, so I think I won't say um, all that much about their connection to the project. Um, and I will come talk to you more about the film afterwards. Thanks. I'll do a couple of questions and then for all of you. And since I assume we'll mostly discuss things that are in the letters or maybe not, but I might ask, I want to ask a couple, about a couple of other things. Um, first, I'm curious about your, um, let's say, sort of the emphasis on America and the Americanness of it from a, a cemetery with American flags at the start of the film mm -hmm. to America the Beautiful at the end of the film. Yeah, you're the first person. <laughs> you're the first person who's ever asked the question about the America the Beautiful at the end of the film, which is so great. Miley, my sound collaborator, just found that in a field recording, and it's kind of perfect. Um, yeah, you know, it's like a great American road movie film um, in a way. But also in the archive, when I was doing research, I think I really very quickly felt a sense of geography and place and space and the ways. Um, the ways that those really shape the voices and the letters. Um, and you know, the difference between um, letters from places that were, or that I imagined were in the 70s, kind of hubs of feminist conversation, like New York or Los Angeles or Chicago or Ann Arbor, um, you know, compared to someone from like the rural farm in Iowa or from the South. So when I went into the archive, I kind of had an idea of what the project might be, um, but the really wrong idea I had was that I would pick one really big city like Los Angeles or New York and do the whole thing in one place. Um, and really quickly, I think from the letters themselves, I came to understand that, that geography is hugely formative and that you know what a lot of the letters are about are these kind of very different, um, different levels and ways of, of accessing feminist community and feminist activism and what, um, yeah, that there's a really substantial difference between um, the letter from someone who really Ms. Magazine is kind of their only connection to, to that type of political space um, versus people who are already engaged in a bigger conversation or might have a consciousness raising group or might have a kind of active political life around feminism. Um, so I think that came out of the archive, um, but also came out of the making of the project, which was made alongside the election between 2015 and 2017. Um, so I was kind of doing these trips and driving around the Midwest and the South um, alongside all this, this kind of moment where people are really thinking and talking about, um, yeah, how we do or don't communicate with each other across geography in the U.S. And how, so, how yeah. difficult was it to find, well, we have four people who were in the film reading their own letters yeah. and two, two people are here today. With us. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, I, and I, I just realized, like, at first I was like, well, how did you find them? But then I actually yeah. realized that would probably be harder to potentially find the other right people to read a letter. But I'm curious about uh -huh. the process of finding... Of the four the people who read no, their... Oh, no, the all other, the other people. All the other people. How did you do the casting? The casting, yeah. So that was, it was very idiosyncratic, and it also evolved a lot as I was working on the project. So I think over the two and a half years of shooting, um, there was definitely a process of, of kind of me pushing myself kind of further and further into... Like, let's try to meet people that I would not ordinarily know or meet or, um, so I, 
guess there are a few different ways. Initially, I started using social media. And like the first shooting I did in Los Angeles, I think was almost all through social media. So I just put a post up and lots of people signed up and it was not a diverse group of people. It was like friends of friends and lots of filmmakers and art people. Um, and so I did that for three weeks. And I think one of the things I realized at the end of that was, um, and I was using a kind of online sign up form where people would sign up and often people would share quite personal things about themselves as they si signed up. So there were kind of ways of just kind of thinking about matchmaking or pairing people with letters through that. Um, but I also, I quickly realized the limitations of social media and the way in which the kind of path of least resistance for this project would have been to really replicate the demographic of like mostly white, mostly middle class. Um, mostly over 40, kind of my age or older, old enough to remember Ms. and feel some kind of nostalgia for Ms. magazine. Um, those were overwhelmingly the types of people who were signing up to be part of the project. Um, so as I realized that, then I had to think about how to, like, how to not do that. Um, so I did a lot of other additional outreach and research for each of the places. And by the end of the project, I really would go into a city and kind of like just look up the population demographic and be like, that's <laughs> like that's what I have to do in the city. So for a city like, you know, New York or Detroit, that's a minority majority city. That like, like that was the task that I gave myself. Um, but yeah, then also I, I did look for a lot of very specific kinds of people and the idiosyncratic casting was that for some letters, it felt much more important than others to really seek out a certain kind of person. Um, so like the police woman in Mason City, Iowa, I met by emailing the police department in Mason City, Iowa, many, many, many times <laughs> until someone wrote back who wanted to be on my art project. <laughs> um, the uh, Madeline, the woman in Rochester, Minnesota, the Christian woman, she was actually Miss Minnesota, which is why she's so poised. She had just won Miss Congeniality <laughs> in the Miss <laughs> USA contest, which is amazing, but I found her by emailing churches in Rochester because I actually really wanted to find a Christian feminist woman to read that letter. So really depending on the letter and how specific the issues were, it felt more or less important to kind of find someone either who had something in common or who kind of would encounter a kind of difference with the letter and both of those things felt important. Um, yeah, so re I really kind of worked it out as I went and tried many things. So I f did this with 306 people and they were not all that interesting. Um, but I think I did it enough that I kind of, yeah, just tried lots of things. And then the people you did cast, to, to what degree do you feel like their notion of giving a performance was important for them or f for mm -hmm. you? Yeah, it really varied. So I didn't direct at all. I'm not a f fiction filmmaker. I have no interest in telling people what to do in front of a camera. Um, sometimes people thought that was weird. They were like, what do you want me to do? Or how do you want me to do it? Um, but I'm really, I'm interested in, in performance and working with performance, but really as a documentary maker where I'm just really interested in what people, like real people are bringing to their encounter with the camera and what they think we're doing with the camera. Um, so whatever people want to do is fine with me. Um, so I didn't direct. Um, some people are more performative, I think, than others. Um, I did stay away, like when people signed up for my project who said they were actors, I didn't, didn't contact them. <laughs> Um, so I did kind of avoid people who were like actual actors. Um, but yeah, I did very little directing and I think people, peop I would, uh, people would do as many takes as they wanted, but people would tell me when they felt like they were done. Um, so however many takes each person wanted to do to get a performance that they were happy with um, was how many we did. Um, but yeah, I didn't direct, and I think there's a pretty wide range of like what people are bringing to that situation, how comfortable people feel in front of a camera, if people are like good performers or bad performers, um, who's good at reading, who's not good at reading, and like what does that also mean about people's you know, education background and like ease with reading from a teleprompter? Um, so all of those things I feel like are just part of part of the stuff that's interesting to me. And how did you come to arrive? I, I I'll, this will be the last one I'll do for right now. Yeah. Um, at, I'll, I'll say, like, the overall rhythm of the film. I mean, for most of them, you keep the long beat after they're done reading, mm -hmm. before you get into the commentary. Obviously, if you, you could close the beat and include more readings. Mm -hmm. But 
obviously tell tell us about that choice about keeping it slower about taking that moment with everybody as well yeah so I never I really from the beginning I think knew that I would keep everything long and even there are some cuts in the readings but I like feel horrible about all of them (laughs) like I really wanted the whole film to just be kind of content like uh, continuous long takes for for each performance and sometimes I couldn't do that for different reasons um but I could of course have made a completely different film with the, you know all 306 people that's quite cutty and moves quickly across time and space and people and includes a lot more voices and you know it would have been nice to include a lot more than 27 people um but it felt really really important to me to kind of give a lot of time and space and patience to each encounter. And I had been watching, so as I was making this film and before I started making this film, I was watching a lot of um, 70s feminist, uh, mostly collectively produced US documentaries um, that came out of consciousness raising methods and that are really like these films that are like just women talking to women for the entire 90 minutes. Um, and what I love about these films is there's a kind of real timeness and length to the way that speaking is treated in the film. Um, I think in my training as a filmmaker, I was often taught like good, like when you edit interviews in a way that's good, right? You're cutting really, making a very hard, like fast cut as soon as someone stops speaking or you're like extracting the sound bite and trying to find like the exact place where someone gets to the point and like that's the valuable kind of material, but in these these feminist 70s film, what I love about them is people are allowed to speak at length and hesitate and stop and reformulate their thoughts. And there's this um, kind of really magical sense of people coming to language in real time and coming to consciousness in real time. Um, and I think that was the quality that I was interested in restaging. Um, so I knew that I wanted to work with kind of slowness and time. Um, so yeah. Cool. Please, uh, comments or questions from any of you at the moment. Please. Yeah, so thanks for the film. Um, as you watch it, or as I watched it, I, I got the sense that uh, you have a critique of the letters that uh, Ms. Magazine actually published. I'd be curious to, uh, if there is such a critique, I'd be curious to hear what it is. Yeah, I don't have that critique. Um, I'm happy to talk about that. And I did, at a certain point, I went back and did, like, diligent, like, like ran all the numbers, right, of what was published, because I actually wanted to answer that question for myself, because in the archive, yeah, I was finding all these really, like, extraordinary letters from marginalized voices or voices that I didn't necessarily expect to um, have been saying those things in the 70s or have been attempting to have a conversation with this kind of mass circulation national feminist magazine. Um, so I did look at everything that was published. Um, and there were some published letters that were not so different from the unpublished letters that are on screen. Um, so it's not like there was a systematic exclusion of a certain type of voice. There was one letter from a sex worker published, a different one than the one that's in my film. But in 1976, there was a letter and there were a series of articles about uh, coyote and kind of activi- um, activism around sex work. Um, so yeah, it's not the case that, that <coughs> those types of letters would not have been published um, necessarily. Um, I think my intervention is more around kind of numbers and quantity and and proportion. Um, So within the whole archive of unpublished letters that I read, I would say there are, for example, 0.2% of the letters were from self-identified writers of color. And then in the magazine, uh, 2% of the published letters Mm -hmm. were, so they actually improved on the demographic of, you know, I think basically the readers were really largely um, not, not women of color. Um, so the, I would say the editors even made an effort to like amplify those voices a little bit, um, but you know, like not enough. Not it doesn't represent the the conversation that's that's happening now or the demographics of big cities or people thinking about feminism. Um, so it's not necessarily a critique of the magazine editors. And I, you know, I will also say I was acutely aware that I was reproducing the problem of the magazine editor because I too am making my super stringent cut of 27 letters that I'm putting up on screen out of like several thousand that I read in the archive. Um, so I think it's not so much about a critique, but it is about this question of what matters to feminism right now and how do these questions evolve and 
you know, in 2017, when I'm a curator of these letters, I'm making different decisions and prioritizing different voices and amplifying different people, um, maybe than the editors in the 70s. So I don't know if that, yeah. does that answer? Yeah. yeah. But I don't think there's like a systematic exclusion of, of any particular type of voice that was happening in, in the published section. And also one more thing about the published section actually is like most magazines, um, the published letters tended to be very on point and about specific articles that had appeared in the magazine. So a lot of the letters that I really loved were just like someone telling their story and those letters almost never got published because they were not kind of like about an article in the magazine. Please? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, it's hard to see. In the back there. Oh, that's Max. Hi. Hi, Max. Do you have a question? Hi, Mom. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> What's your question? <laughs> so, only one letter in the film was actually ever published. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking, do you have a personal, like, opinion on like do you think there was a specific reason about like what you specifically were finding or is it something that's just about the general like type of letter you were looking for of which ones i put in the film yeah oh you mean like how did i choose which letters to put in the film yeah i think i was looking so when i was looking at the letters i was looking for um, both kind of letters that were typical, like there were certain kind of letters that I would see lots and lots of women writing letters about, um, so those kinds of letters I wanted to represent. And then I think I was really looking for letters also that felt extraordinary or unusual, that there was maybe only one of or not a lot of in the archive. And then, you know, letters that felt contemporary or felt like they were kind of resonating with things that were happening now and that changed while I was shooting the project so there were some letters that felt not that interesting that would suddenly start to feel really interesting um, like the letter in Greensboro North Carolina about the KKK rally and the interracial relationship um, I had read that letter like three or four times and not thought it was like a particularly exciting letter and then I reread that letter right out right as I was planning my trip to the south and that was like a week after the election that I flew to North Carolina to start shooting in the south and then suddenly that letter took on all of these new meanings. Um, so I think, yeah, like I think um, history looks really different all the time depending on what's happening in the present. Um, it's okay if, w yeah. if it's if you which is the one that was published. Oh, the letter that was published was the North Dakota the gun letter, written by the American Indian woman. Yeah, you had a question. Yeah. Um, first of all, thanks. And but what really surprised me? Well, there were many surprises. Yeah. Um, and revelations, but I didn't expect so much landscape. Mm -hmm. Um, and I wondered if that was part of your original conception or that sort of came out in the shooting that you realized, oh, the spaces are so different and I want to honor the differences in those spaces as well as the difference in time and the difference <laughs> in the variety, diversity of women. Yeah, that was happening the whole time in the project, the shooting landscape. So every time I filmed readings in a place, I would also film landscapes. Um, so I kind of knew I was going to be working with landscapes. And it really came out of what Adam was asking me about earlier, about thinking about geography and space and place as kind of a really important part of the project. But also thinking about kind of public space. Um, you know, I th really think of the letter to the editor as a form of public discourse. So when you're writing to a national magazine, you're not writing to your friend or talking to your friend, but you're really entering <coughs> into a kind of space where you're addressing a public. Um, so I wanted to kind of put those performances in, in public space and think about what public space looks like. And, you know, if there's people there or if it's really empty, which it's pretty empty in a lot of the country. Um, so using those landscapes as a way to think about what, yeah, just publicness. Which also emphasizes how isolated yeah. <coughs> people who were, who felt spoken to by the magazine might be in their particular location. Yeah. And now, so I think that's an interesting tension in the film, because there is, I was doing all this thinking about, like, yeah, collective speaking and conversation and consciousness raising, but yeah, there's a lot of loneliness and isolation, um, I think, in the frame, in the 
and the fact that I'm having these one-on-one -on -one interactions with people and they're not talking to each other or meeting each other, um, I think there's a kind of loneliness in the, you know, the act of writing a letter at your kitchen table alone to a national magazine. There's a kind of loneliness in the kind of internet, like, discourse political spaces that we have now. Um, so I was interested in all of that. Um, but at the same time, I think there is a kind of collective thing that happens in the film where people may be standing alone in a lonely public space, but they're also actually, like, speaking across time with, with somebody 40 years ago, and there's a kind of conversation that's happening anyway, um, and that hopefully also happens with the audience in the process of kind of being with these people and listening. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Why was it important for you to include the, the, the man around the gay volleyball club? Oh. In Claudia's letter. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, lo I just, I, he's, love I love, yeah, I love him. <laughs> <laughs> he's kind of, <laughs> no, I love how he just, like, t he just comes into the frame, and just the way, I don't know, he's kind of a mansplainer, he just really enters the frame <laughs> and, like, takes over. <laughs> um, yeah. But he gets out. Yeah, he, he gets out. Yeah. And <laughs> He's a lovable mansplainer. <laughs> what, uh, how, what was the process of finding the prisoner for the last letter? Oh my god, that took the longest. Actually, that took five months, and that was the hardest kind of casting project for the whole film. It felt super, super important to, to do that reading with someone. It felt important to include that letter. It felt important to do it with someone who was incarcerated. Um, and I was very lucky. So around the time that I was starting to think about casting for that letter, um, there was a big national news story about Michelle Jones. That I don't know if anyone remembers this story, um, but she actually had come up through the exact same prison system, Indiana Women's Prison, um, and had had a very long sentence um, starting when she was really young. Um, but inside of the prison, she had become involved in a prison education program that was like really, really rigorous and interesting and had become a really serious carceral scholar from inside of prison. Um, so she had then applied to PhD programs as soon as she got out of prison and got into Harvard. Um, and the big kind of news media scandal was that Harvard had rescinded her admission um, after they, I guess, found out about her background. Um, I think she's now at NYU, and good for <laughs> good for NYU. But anyway, because of the story, I, I had just happened to read about this Indiana Women's Prison Education Program, um, and they included the name of one of the women who ran that program. So I was able to contact that woman and tell her what I was doing. Um, so she she helped me get in touch with people on the inside. But what was hard, she initially had a different idea of someone who could read for the project who had been actually incarcerated since 1974, which is really mm. awful. Um, so we were corresponding for a couple of months through JPay, which is this kind of corporatized system for communicating with your loved ones in prison where you like pay a lot of money for every email. Um, so we were emailing for a few months and trying to work out the logistics of how to do it, and then she just stopped responding and disappeared. And I, I later learned that she had been moved to solitary and had lost her JPA privileges. So then I had to start again with um, with someone else. Um, but yeah, that that took a long time. And then you yeah, just had important. to, and then record a phone call. We did it on the phone. Yeah. Did that and whatever more details. I was going to say like the, yeah. the prison people that didn't. Put up any other. Uh, I mean, they wouldn't let obstacles? me shoot in the prison. I've, of course, first asked if I could come to the prison and shoot, and that was no. And then I felt I didn't ask about. I didn't ask permission to film outside, but the prison had moved actually, so that's not the current Indiana Women's Prison building, but the former building that that would have been the the building in the 70s where the original writer was incarcerated. Um, yeah, it's complicated. Yeah. I'm actually interested to hear the experience, I guess, of the women who are here tonight yeah. who read their letters, and I'm curious to know what their response is I am too. to the film. <laughs> <laughs> if you're willing to dive in. If you, you want, know, or, or, uh, no pressure. <laughs> what was the question I read? What's the, how did you feel about the film? What was, yeah, as someone who was in the film. Oh. Um, I sure love the landscape. <laughs> um, it was very, it was very uh, moving to me. You know, it was a long time ago. I know what those feelings were then, um, and I could say 
many things about why that's still an important political place to be. I think it was last week that um, yet again implants uh, were found to be carcinogenic mm -hmm. and this has gone over and over and over again mm -hmm. as there is now an increase in, in, in the um, uh, insistence that people get reconstruction. Um, and uh, it felt good, and it felt good to be with, with all those, with all, with all the people to be, to remember what it was like uh, in the 70s, to remember the women's movement, and the camaraderie that was uh, essential, which we don't have now. Mm -hmm. And so that's what came to me in the film, was that there were all these individuals with whom we were in alliance. And I appreciate that. Yeah, thank you. Jenny, did you want to say anything? Jenny. Um, you don't have to. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I really enjoyed the film. I thought it was great. And it was kind of fun to see, to see me in, in that storage unit <laughs> with the, bringing out the artwork, you know, that, um, was so important to me. So I, I liked it. I thought it was great. Yeah. Yeah, but you know, I, I really enjoyed that one where that man came out. <laughs> I, I just thought, I got to kick out of that. <laughs> yeah, so, I mean, you know, because at that point you didn't really know she was a lesbian, so you, it, it was kind of like this little foreshadowing. <laughs> <laughs> Do you remember, though, writing those letters? Or was it like a surprise to be approached? Oh my god, when she first wrote to me, I was like, what? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't remember writing the letter at all. And and then, but then I, you know, I thought, maybe I did. And and then, you, you know, we corresponded and and I realized Oh, that has to be me. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and then when you sent the letter, and and I saw it on my the stationery mm -hmm. I had designed, you know, that I thought was so great at the time, which was <laughs> horrible, but <laughs> at the time I thought it was so great. Um, and, we, and that was that was cool. Yeah, go back. Yeah. Did did either of you, or in what sense, did either of you feel like you were having a conversation with your younger self? When you're younger, so. <laughs> <laughs> uh, not no, really. Not, that wasn't really <laughs> <laughs> uh, Claudia talked. Claudia, the woman in Binghamton, mm -hmm. uh, who read her coming out letter from when she was 16. She, uh, I did a screening with her in Binghamton, and she did talk about that. But she was much younger when she wrote her, her letter. Uh, any more questions or thoughts as well? I was curious about the the girl in the Marvel T-shirt mm -hmm. as well, and finding her or being able to find a a thirteen year old. Who yeah, I filmed a, with a bunch of kids, um, always through parents, almost always through parents, um, just for consent reasons. Um, so I think her mom, yeah, she wasn't like particularly cast. Her mom was a. I think a friend of a friend. Like I just figured out that someone I knew knew people in Middletown who had a 13-year-old daughter. Um, yeah, so sometimes sometimes I spent a lot of time doing very specific casting, and then other times just something really amazing happened that was lucky and that I couldn't have anticipated, and I think there are both things in the film. Yeah. I, I just can't imagine how long it took you to create this these put these puzzle pieces together ha choosing the 27 out of the 300 pacing the ones that you finally put in deciding what order they needed to go in putting some comic relief in from time to time <laughs> all of those this decisions and stuff I, c I can't imagine how long that must have taken you yeah, um, it's just editing. <laughs> I think we all do it, those of us who edit. 
And this film was fast for me, actually. Um, this was a three and a half year film, and most of my other films have been five, six years. And I think there was, it, somehow it felt like there was so much momentum around the political climate and yeah, I actually really felt a sense of kind of collective energy everywhere from everyone continuously while I was shooting and making the project and it came together much faster than some other things I've worked on. But yeah, it took it took time. How many letters are in the collection that you did read through? I read through a couple thousand and I scanned about, so there were 800 that I kind of logged in a database that I considered <coughs> working with and that I also mapped. So some letters I didn't shoot just because of where they were. So part of it was kind of how could I make road trips that move through different places with letters. Um, so yeah, I was like working with 800 maybe letters. And then, um, well, we'll just, we have to wrap it up. Um, okay. But I was curious about like, if you think there's a way that, or it has it had, uh, an impact, do you think, in a contemporary feminist uh, activities or in any way? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, it's great. I'm really happy when younger people come to see the film. Often the audiences skew older. I think some of that is just who goes to movies and who like film festival audiences are tend to be older, which is which is worrying for those of us who love cinemas and like movies um but i think some of it is like again who remembers ms who thinks this project sounds great when they read about it um but consistently what i hear when younger people do come to screenings which i'm always super happy about um people tell me which is great that they expected this film about 70s feminism to be really um like about kind of their preconceptions, I guess, of, of uh, very white, very middle class, kind of second wave feminism, and that they're excited to learn that there were all these other kinds of voices and conversations happening in the 70s. Um, so yeah, I don't know if there's like an immediate effect, but, but it's good for people to think those thoughts, I think. Wonderful. Can yeah. I ask one more question? Yeah. Please. You made this at such a time of hairpin turn in national politics. Yeah. I mean, you started this off as the uh, sort of campaigning was gearing up. Yeah, the and first reading in the film, uh, Maya, who reads about wanting to be president when she grew up, yes. that was uh, the summer before the election. So that letter was read in a moment where it seemed possible. So you were out in the field during some of the time. I mean, most women, even if they didn't love Hi Hillary, mm -hmm. ex really did think, well, of course she's going to win. And mm -hmm. her the time has come for there to be a woman president. Right. But did you have any sense since you were out all over the place, like uh, this is probably going south? Um, mm. I mean, did you have any predictive <laughs> sense this is not? But I didn't go to the Midwest until, oh no, that's from wrong. No, you know, I had the opposite sense. I was in the Midwest uh, before the election. Um, yeah, my really big Midwest trip was like Chicago all the way up to South Dakota and like all the way down to Kansas and back. It was a 2000 mile loop and that trip was I think October before the election and yeah I felt such a false sense of like that I was just like meeting all these amazing feminist women in these tiny small towns in the middle of nowhere in the Midwest and it just seemed like everyone's a feminist everywhere and it's great. Um, so no but it was but it's nice to know that I think, you know, it's, um, yeah, I mean, I think I'm from the East Coast and live on the West Coast, and it was really wonderful to meet all these people in other places. <coughs> May they rise. May they rise, yeah. <laughs> I want to, with that, I want to thank you, Irene, for coming and talking with us about your yeah, film tonight. Thank you. And Thanks thank you all me. for coming to see it. Thank you.